And the brother that's going to bring it to us tonight is Pastor David Taylor, who is here with his uh, with the youth groups, too. I think junior high and high school are with us. Hey, if you're in junior high or high school, would you stand up and make some noise? Yeah, way back there. And anybody else? Anybody else? Yay, we're so glad that you're with us. So glad that you're with us. So David Taylor is going to come up and take us into Romans. Romans chapter 10. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, you high schoolers were really loud. Thanks, guys. That was awesome. Thank you. Hold on. i got to raise this up real quick. They never make these for tall people. All right. Um, I just first want to say um, I am so blessed to be able to, to be here tonight and uh, to share the word with you guys. Uh, I love doing high school uh, with all my heart, but it is awesome to be here with adults and to be able to share the word. And so I'm excited. And as Bill said, um, I am praying along with, I know many people, that God would just do something great and do something amazing. And, and each of us that ever come up here and that teach or that do anything, uh, we just want to get out of the way and just allow God to do what he does best. And so that is my prayer uh, for us all tonight, that, that God would just move and do what he does best. Um, having said that, I have, uh, I was talking to Bill a little bit earlier. I got a lot I want to go through uh, in only a little bit of time. So uh, if you guys have your Bibles, why don't we open them up to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And just by a show of hands real quick as you're flipping or with the other hand, you're not flipping the Bible with real quick. Um, how many of you have read Romans before? See, okay. So you know it's no small task, right? It is, it's kind of a beefy book, right? It's beefy. There's a lot of meat in it. It's, it's very theological. Um, when Bill assigned this text uh, to me and, and I went home and I read it, I was both uh, excited and a little bit petrified because I'm like, oh man, like I want to preach this for like an hour and a half. And so we, we agreed, uh, 50 minutes, guys. That's, that's all I'm asking for you guys. Romans 10. Um, what I want to do is, well, we're going to be primarily in verse 9 and 10. But I can't just drop us off in the middle. You know, we need to get context. And Paul is in the middle uh, of, of a thought. And so I don't want to disrupt that thought at all. So what we're going to do is we're going to start reading from Romans 10, uh, verse 1. And we're going to read down to verse 13, just so we can kind of complete this thought uh, that, that Paul is talking about here. So we're going to start verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Verse 4, Christ is the culmination of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is uh, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And here's, here's our text, that these two verses coming up. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. God, I am, I am privileged. I am excited, Lord, to see what you are going to do. God, just the reminder, it, it's not, God, will you move? It's, God, how will you move? Father, I pray that you truly do what you want to do tonight. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would convict 
those who need conviction. You would draw people to yourself. You would encourage those who are needing encouragement. God, we thank you that you speak. We thank you that we can hear you, Jesus. And Father, I just pray for any distraction um, that, that maybe some of us came here with. Uh, Lord, I pray that all of those would be able to just leave and, and just be able to hear from you. God, we so love you. And we ask these things in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Um, just for the sake, like I said, of, of understanding the flow of thought, um, since we're, I dropped this off in chapter 10. For those of you who read Romans, it's a, like I said, it's a beefy book. There's a lot going on. Uh, just kind of summing up, Paul, at the very beginning of Romans, he addresses a, a problem, a pretty big problem, and it's the problem of sin. He says that humanity, every single one of us, is trapped in sin, that we are held accountable and we are responsible for this sin. And there's no amount of good deeds we can perform in order to save ourselves. He paints this picture, we need a savior. We are in trouble. This world is broken, right? So with this understanding, as Paul is painting this picture in the first couple of chapters, he then lays out the gospel, the good news, right? That God, the creator God, and I'm like looking around, you can look at the sky, that the God that creates absolutely everything, right? Being moved by his love, being moved by his compassion for his creation, for people, sent his son Jesus down to die that we may know him, that we may have eternity with him, that we may have eternal life with him. And it goes on and it says that he himself defeats sin and death. He conquers sin and death. So he presents this problem and then he's building this argument, this whole book of the solution. And the solution is Christ. It is Jesus himself. And so he, he kind of paints this picture throughout Romans. And then we kind of get to the text that we just read. And in the first eight verses, what we see is we see Paul. And Paul is an apostle and he is anguishing. He is broken over his fellow people. His, the, the, the Jews is what it says in the refusal to submit to God and, and his righteousness. Paul's heart is breaking because he sees people that refuse to accept Jesus on the basis of faith and they try to work towards God by, by, by strict adherence to the law and, and, and just doing good works. And his heart breaks. And if you know anything about Paul, Paul was once one of those people, right? He was like a Pharisee of the Pharisees is what it says. And so he is a legitimate, like my heart is, is breaking for these people who are, who are lost, they were lost in religious zeal. It's crazy. It says that these people, they actually were, were religiously uh, pursuing uh, after the law what they thought might have been good. And Paul's saying they are missing it. They are completely missing it. And then Paul, in the, in the, in the couple verses leading up to, to 9 and 10, he kind of compares and contrasts. And he says, listen, there's like two ways, I guess you could say, of salvation. You have God's way, which is the only way. And it says God's way of salvation is grace. It cannot be earned. And then you have man's twisted kind of thinking, uh, man's twisted way of, I am just going to work if I just obey the law you know, to the fullest. I can do it, right? He, he shows comparing and contrasting. And then we get to verse 9 and 10. And I'm going to read that again. And then Paul, he says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him, from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified or, or are made right, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You know, and I think it's safe to assume, as we talked, you know, that there were, there were Jewish people that would have heard Paul speaking this. There would have been Jewish people who are reading this, and I think it's very safe to assume that they must have been fired up over what he said. Listen, that is too easy. Don't tell me that. That is too easy. It's, it's too simple to buy into. Okay? It is, it, you can't just declare with your mouth and believe in your heart and then all of a sudden my sins go away. No way. Okay? No, don't tell me that. Right? 
Where's the obedience to the law of Moses? Where's the strict adherence to the, to the traditions of the fathers? Don't tell me you're getting rid of circumcision. Do not tell me that, right? Like, they're, these people are, are, are freaking out, right? Don't tell me that my good works and my zeal for God won't save me. Don't tell me that. And I think it's safe to assume that because Paul dedicated an entire letter in the Bible called Galatians talking about this exact issue. These people and, and the, these religious teachers of the day, and they were teaching, listen, Jesus is cool and all, but you need Jesus plus this, plus the law, plus Moses, plus circumcision, plus this, and plus that. Jesus plus anything is not what Paul is preaching right here. And you know what? When, when I'm studying this and when I look at this, it shows me something. I think it shows all of us something. The message of grace, the gospel, it will always offend the spirit of pride. Always. The gospel is an amazingly offensive message to the proud. Why? Okay, not all of it. We weren't born saved, right? So maybe you at one point were extremely offended by the gospel at times. Well, well here, here's why. It's the message that proclaims boldly that your works, that our works, that my deeds, they cannot save me. Whoa, don't tell me that, right? Kind of sound like the people that Paul's talking about. Being moral won't save me, won't save us. Doing good things, doing ethical, you know, you know, things, right? Being nice to others won't save us. These are all great things, but it won't save us. No amount of good deeds will ever erase the sin that every single one of us are plagued with. This is, this is, this is the reality. Paul says this in Galatians. Again, I'm just going to read it. He says, know that a person is not justified or, or, or made right by the works of the law but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified or made right by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. Paul, full of the Holy Spirit, he's claiming some, some real big stuff here. He's, he's, he's saying a lot. He proclaims boldly, listen, salvation, it's, it's, it's of the Lord. And by declaring or confessing with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, that is to say, what, what, he, what, he's, what he's describing is, you are in agreement with who Jesus says he is, and Jesus claimed to be God, right? And by believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Again, verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Now, I talked to a, a couple pastors here on staff um, about this text, um, and, and, I, and I felt like I really, really wanted to uh, address this. And I want to be as clear as I possibly can be because I definitely don't want to be uh, misunderstood on what I'm saying. Declaring the words, Jesus is Lord, and receiving salvation is not the emphasis that Paul is saying right here. And I really hope we don't miss this. He's not giving us a, uh, a magic a formula, right? It's just a phrase that we say and it's like, boom, we're good. You know what I mean? That's not what Paul is saying. Salvation comes only to those who trust Jesus. Again, that might offend because that is an offensive message to people that want to work to be good enough. But grace comes along and says, you don't have to. I have done it. Not me. Jesus, right? Jesus has secured this. It's a radical, radical message. Salvation comes only to those who have placed their trust in Jesus. Now, when we hear the gospel, we'll respond in faith in many ways, right? Um, we, I've, many people have raised their hands at the end of a service or, or have, have come forward for an altar call or have prayed the prayer, the sinner's prayer. And all of those are great. But in all of those scenarios, our emphasis needs always to be on trusting Jesus with our lives. Our confidence should never be placed anywhere but in Jesus. You guys checking with me? You guys, you guys understand what I'm saying? When Paul says to declare with your mouth and believe in your heart, I want to talk about that. When he says that, he is talking about a complete abandonment of finding hope anywhere else. 
He's not just talking about, oh, just, just, just say this and just, just have a thought towards God on this. It is a complete abandonment of finding hope anywhere else but Jesus himself. It's not just about merely uh, intellectually agreeing to uh, an argument or to facts. Um, Bill, I think, I think Bill has said it a couple of weeks ago, it might have even been this week. Uh, it, it's not just about believing that Jesus was a historical figure, right? There's something deeper here. It's not believing that he died on the cross. That's history. We can find that out, you know, uh, secular history or not. That's, that's, just, that's just there. He's talking about a complete throwing yourself on Jesus, believing and trusting that he will hold you. I use this all the time in high school, but every single one of you, you guys came down, you sat down in a chair, right? Uh, may, maybe there's one person that thought this, I'm not sure, but you come in and I don't think you're thinking, whoa, what if this chair just breaks and falls, right? That'd be crazy. You have trust that it will hold you and hold all of your weight. This is, this is, this is the idea when, 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 when Jesus asks for, for, for you to believe or when Paul is saying you need to believe in your heart, the innermost part of who you are, you are casting all of your weights. All your eggs are in that basket. There is no plan B. It is all Jesus. Salvation was God's idea, and I'm so grateful for that. All we are required to do is respond in faith. As James Edwards puts it, he said this. He said, the gospel is salvation without limits a universal promise for everyone who believes. I love that idea. I mean, it is just like, salvation is available to every single person. It's available to all. Doesn't mean everybody will be saved again because salvation comes to those who trust Jesus. But salvation is for everyone because the gospel emphatically declares that Christ came for the sins of the world, that he died for the sins of the world. That includes you, that includes me. And I got to be honest with you guys. I'm studying this and, and, and I'm praying over this and I'm, I'm, and I'm just, just going back and forth on, on certain things. And what I keep coming back to is just like, I, I, am, I am blown away. I'm absolutely blown away as I read and as I come to know Jesus more. Not as I learn uh, an ideology more, but as I come to know the person of Jesus, the real person of Jesus. You guys with me? And I think to myself, and I'm like, what kind of God is this? What kind of message is this? What kind of God would humble himself to the point of allowing his own creation to nail him to a cross just to secure us, just, just so we could have the ability to come to know him? What kind of message is this that the, that the creator and the sustainer, literally, of, of everything came not to make us better people, right? The Bible's not like a self-help book. He didn't come to make us better people. He came to make us new people. He came to make us into a completely new creation. Praise God that he did that, right? This is what he does. What kind of God is this that he would become our sin that we could become the very righteousness of God. I study this and I am just blown away. I think if you guys are anything like me, you are really good at forgetting. I'm very good at forgetting. You can talk to my wife afterwards. She will attest. I think we forget sometimes. I think we forget what he has done. I think we forget what he is doing currently. I had a conversation with somebody not too long ago, and people say, when you're going through a terribly hard time, you might have heard people say, hey, the Lord will use it, right? We've heard that before. Listen, the Lord will use it, yes, but he is using it currently. I believe that I'm up here tonight, um, really, I, I really believe that I'm here tonight to tell you that God, that he and his love and in his grace, his mercy, his compassion, that he desires relationship with you. Not because he's needy, not because he needs it, but because he loves you and he wants you to have what the Bible would describe as an abundant life. This life is not realized or can't be known apart from him. 
How do we know this? Well, until we are in harmony with the one who created us, we're not living in the, in the, in the way that he would want us to live. And what I don't want to do, I, I'm not going to stand up here and I'm not going to uh, pretend or, or claim to know what the majority of you are going through. Like I said, I'm back in high school a lot, right? So I know some of you, but I don't know a lot of you. Um, I'm not going to claim to know what you guys go through. I'm not going to claim to understand the things that you had to endure in your childhood. I'm not going to claim to understand your family upbringing. I'm not going to claim to understand or to know the things that you struggle with deeply that maybe even your closest friends don't know. I don't know those things. I don't know those fears. I don't know those insecurities. But what I do know is there's a God in heaven and I mean, he is after you. He loves you. The best word I could think of is that his love is supreme. And if you ever find yourself questioning, regardless if you have any kind of background in Jesus, the Bible, Christianity, church, whatever, I pray that if you ever question God's love, how could God love somebody like me? I pray that you look to the cross, which settles that forever. Jesus willingly went there to die for you, to die for me, to give us purpose, to give us hope, to give us that abundant life that I'm talking about. He came. I want to close with this. I, um, I read this quote. It's by a guy. Let me, let me pull up his name. His name is John Phillips. He's a Bible commentator. He said this, he said, the two greatest miracles of the Christian faith are the incarnation, which tells us that Christ has come down from heaven, and the resurrection, which tells us that he has come up from the grave. Listen to this last part. They only have to be believed in the heart. I stand up here tonight, guys, and I am, I am praying and even as Bill said before, before I even came up here, that God just moves. He kind of likes doing that. He kind of likes doing God's stuff, right? I stand up here tonight praying that you, that some of you, that a lot of you would respond to Jesus. I stand here tonight with a heart that longs to see people turn from the sin that is literally pushing the Savior away. Now, Jesus, there is no depth that he cannot reach there is no loss that he cannot comfort. There's no wound he can't heal. The Bible declares him as the, the everlasting God. I love that title. The God that has no beginning, has no end. So far beyond and above us and yet still humbled himself, came down relational. We know him. We now have access to him because of Jesus. I am blown away. I feel like just the longer I walk, I am, I am blown away. And so I said I was going to close. I don't want to do that. I'm going to close and talk for another 15 minutes. I ramble sometimes. I pray that you guys would take this, even these, these, these verses that we just read that are, that are simple. And sometimes we overlook the simplicity and we would understand that God is accessible, that salvation is available. And I pray that you place your trust truly. I want to read these verses one last time so it is just so ingrained in every one of us. And then I want to pray for us. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Um, I'm going to pray and if the, the band wants to come back up and, and lead us in a couple more songs, that'd be great. Would you guys bow your heads with me? Lord, um, God, I thank you 
God, I thank you that you saw me, you saw us. God, when you were on the cross, you looked at us and you said, they are worth it. God, in those moments where we struggle and we feel no worth or negative worth, I pray that we just look to you, look to that cross. Holy Spirit, I even pray now that you would just do work on the hearts of the people that came here. It's so amazing, God, that, um, you know, as, as, as people, as humans, we have our limitations. Jesus, you don't. God, I pray for a mighty move of your spirit. I pray that there would be people who truly, maybe for the first time, trust you. That they realize it's not about just doing good stuff. That being a follower of Jesus is not about church attendance. It's not about how many times I pray today. It's, about, it's not about how many times I've confessed to other people. It's simply about you, Jesus, about what you did, about what you accomplished, Jesus, on that cross, dying for us, securing freedom, God, securing uh, salvation for those who trust you. God, I pray that repentance would not be something that uh, we push away in fear, God, but it would be something that we embrace as a tool that just brings us close. We thank you for who you are. And Lord, again, you know the people. You know the people that, uh, that don't know you right now. And again, I just pray in your name, Jesus, that you would reach and you would just do again what you do best. Thank you for being awesome. Thank you for being mighty. Thank you for being full of mercy and grace. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. A, a friend will tell you the truth. True? How many of you got a friend? Anybody got a friend that will tell you the truth? And Paul, Paul just told you the truth. He said, all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Salvation is not a system that you follow. Salvation comes from meeting your Savior. There's no salvation without a Savior. There's no peace without the Prince of Peace. There, there is no hope without the anchor of our hope who is Jesus Christ. It all comes down to a person. And I just know there's, there's somebody here tonight and maybe a bunch of somebodies that you have been trying to put together the system that would finally put your life together and finally find that peace and finally find you know all all those things there's no redemption without the redeemer and and you need that redeemer tonight this has been a presentation of refuge calvary chapel huntington beach for more information about our ministry please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495 set free